When we began our First Peter series several months ago, I share with you a story from church history. Church history records that Peter and his wife were martyred. And the, the story goes that to elevate Peter's pain, uh, the, the captors took Peter's wife out first and crucified Peter's wife in front of him. And, and, and the story is told that Peter, to encourage her as she's dying on a cross, he told her these words are on the screen. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Afterward, Peter was led to be crucified, and he asked that he would not be crucified in the same way as his Lord, so he asked to be crucified upside down, and church history records that Peter was crucified upside down in a cross. Now, if we're to back up into Peter's life, and we're reading one of his letters, we're finishing up one of his letters here this morning, as we look at the life of Peter, Peter spoke a really good game before the crucifixion. Peter was confident, he was bold, he was often the voice of the disciples, but in that moment of truth, when the, the time of the crucifixion came, most of you know the story that, that Peter denied Jesus, denied him vehemently. He ran away along with the rest. And, and the scriptures here uh, later on in the end of the Gospel of John record that Jesus pursued Peter. Jesus went out to Peter. Jesus forgave and restored Peter by grace and gave him direction, gave him renewed passion to follow hard after Christ, to, as Jesus told him in the end of John, to feed his sheep, to be a good pastor shepherd, uh, apostle to, to the people. And so Peter began his ministry. We, in Sunday school today, uh, some of us were looking at Acts 2 as Peter preaches as after Pentecost. And, and here, Peter is, is writing this letter. He's concerned for churches that are going through persecution. In chapter 1, verse 1, there's a whole region of churches that are going through significant persecution, and Peter has a shepherd's heart for them. He doesn't want them to fail at that moment of truth. He wants them to pursue Christ with all their life, to continue moving forward spiritually, to be good testimonies for the name of Jesus. And in these closing comments today that we're going to look at in chapter 5, the last words of 1 Peter, it's, a, it's really a, a neat zooming out. Peter zooms out from the weeds of the persecution that these churches are going through, the hard times that they're in, and he zooms out and puts it in perspective of the cosmic battle between God Almighty and Satan, his great opposer. This is what God, Peter does here in this passage, what God has for us. We get to zoom out to the cosmic battle of God and Satan. And the, the kind of special thing is, it's, it's not that we're just standing there watching. We're participants in this cosmic battle. There's a purpose for your life and for mine as we put it in perspective of this great cosmic warfare that is taking place. I'm going to read 1 Peter 5, beginning verse 8, down through the end of the chapter, and I'm just going to comment right away that I will not be covering much of verse 12 and beyond. Uh, we're going to focus in on verses 8 through 11, but we'll read the entire passage here this morning. Let's start in verse 8. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, 
elect together with you greets you. And so does Mark, my son, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. These closing comments give us this perspective. And and according to these words here, I want to center our thoughts in, as I mentioned, verses 8 through 11. I want to think about our participation in this cosmic battle. What are four important elements from this this text? First is this. The first element is to stay alert. Stay alert. The opening words of verse 8 give these imperatives. Be sober. Be vigilant. It's a call to action. And it's easy to miss the significance of these things if we don't connect it with the context, okay? So look with me back to the couple verses before this. We covered these last week. We, were, we, we covered them because they really go with this whole aspect of, remember Peter says, we're going to look at the house of God first. And so he looks at elders. He looks at church members, and then he says, yes, all of you, in verse 5, be submissive to one another. But verse 6 kind of applies that, and here's, here's, so we want to back up that application as well today. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You see, if we back up in the context to this previous thought, if we're to, if we're to be the household of God, And if we're to live as lights to the world and and, and walk in this display of who Jesus is, we want to stop just complaining about the circumstances. We want to be the church. So what's the house of God to look like? Pastors, you're encouraged with these things. People, you're encouraged with these things. And all of you put on humility. Well, if we're to kind of think about how we apply this, we're to submit ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Now, if I was to tell you something like that, there there might be in you, if I'm to humble myself and I'm to submit to God's mighty hand, there's a a sense by which we might take this passive approach to Christianity. I'm to submit under God's hand. He's the mighty one. He's going to do all these things. He's going to bring the victory in the end anyway. So, So who am I? What am I to do? There's no real role of me in this cosmic battle. I I have no real place here. I'm going to sit back and let God do his thing. He's the mighty one. And so in the the context here, it's very important. The next thing Peter says is what? Be sober. Be vigilant. It's a call to action. Don't don't sit on the sidelines. Get into the battle. God's calling you to action. Active submission to God. Active faith. Be sober. Be vigilant. With sober, we often think about alcohol. Alcohol. This is not a message against alcohol here this morning. Sober is the idea of being under control, having self-control. He's used it in the book already in chapter 1, verse 13. He said, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, be under control, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He said it in chapter 4, verse 7. He said, the end of all things is at hand, Therefore, be serious, be sober, and watchful in your prayers. So he said it a couple times here, vigilant. There's another word here, be vigilant. It means to be alert, be ready. It's the same word that Peter has heard several times from the teachings of Jesus. If you look at the, what we call the Passion Week of Jesus, the final week of Jesus before the crucifixion, Jesus taught and taught and taught in Jerusalem. And in several of his parables during that week, in several of his lessons, he would tell his disciples and he would use the illustration of being watchful, being ready as the end time is coming. Be watchful. I think of one of the more familiar passages uh, there, even in chapter, even from that moment of his teaching, the night of Jesus. I think of this in Matthew 26, the night of Jesus' betrayal. You remember he goes along, he leaves some of the disciples here. He goes a little further and he says, uh, Peter, James, and John, you sit here and would you just stay awake with me? Would you stay alert with me? And he goes over further and he prays and he comes back and three times he finds his disciples sleeping. And he says, couldn't you just watch with me? Couldn't you just stay alert with me? It's the same word here. Peter's heard this phrase. 
Be alert, be vigilant, be ready. And he failed in the garden. He had denied the Lord. Jesus would tell his men in that moment in Matthew 26, verse 41, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Watch, be vigilant, and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's heard this from Jesus. So why should we stay awake? Why should we stay alert? Why are we called to this in verse 8? We're called to this active submission, this alert readiness, because we have a real enemy. Our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. A couple weeks ago, Ethan, Luke, and I were out turkey hunting. We went out early in the morning. And uh, kind of 20 yards from me, Ethan's down the hill a little bit, kind of facing out these two trails. I'm in the middle, kind of facing the same direction as Ethan. And up to my left, maybe six, eight yards away is Luke. And he's facing kind of up the hill this way. And we're just sitting there, kind of the, the morning sounds of the forest is waking up and the birds are starting to chirp. And, and uh, it's real quiet out there. And all of a sudden, Luke tells me, deer. He says, deer. And, and I said, I was like, I couldn't, I, like, you know, at first you always say what? And like, you didn't, but I just paused. What did he say? He said deer. Okay, so I, I slowly, you know, my, now I'm, I'm really alert, right? Now I'm like very, very aware of what's going on. And I do all of a sudden hear something behind me. And I peek, I'm sitting in a tree behind me. And I peek around this tree. And there's a pretty large doe that's walking almost straight at me. And then it begins, and I'm, and so I begin, I'm like, I'm going to try my turkey call. It's like not tur- deer season, so I'm like, the deer safe, you, you deer lovers out there, okay? Um, so I'm like, I'm chirping this, this turkey call because I'm the caller and my boys are on the sides with shotguns. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, chirping. The deer's like looking over at me. What's over there? Where's, this, where's the turkey at? And it's just walking along. I mean, it's like less than 20 yards from me. And it's, then it starts to turn right towards Ethan. And um, Ethan must have smelled bad that morning because it must have smelled him and ran off, you know? Um, no, I'm just kidding. If I wasn't Ethan, it was just, they, they got too close and it finally smelled us. Uh, and, and ran off there. Um, but, you know, think about that moment with me, and my senses were super alert all of a sudden when I hear him say deer. But, but what would have happened if he just said, lion? Like a 500-pound apex predator is 20 yards behind me. Like, it probably would have been a little different scenario. We would have been like, oh, cool, let's just chirp and see if he comes in closer, right? It's like, um, that would have been really exciting right, if there was a, if there was a lion uh, over behind us. I mean, just, just think for a moment, why should we be sober? Why should we be alert? Because the devil is real. And he's pictured in this passage as the chief adversary who is a, going about like a roaring lion. If there's a roaring, roaring lion, you know, 20 yards is like that middle window there. I mean, like, if a roaring lion is that close to me, like, I mean, everything in you is screaming in different directions, right? You're like, everything is alert. Like, your, your senses are going crazy. Be alert. Be ready. This text says, what's interesting here, he doesn't just say he's the Lord's adversary. What does he say in this text? He describes him as your adversary. Folks, if you're with the Lord, the Lord's enemy is your enemy, right? You have an adversary. It is the chief adversary, the opposer, the devil. And I want you to notice aspects about the devil here, okay? Yes, he stands opposed to Christ and and all his opponents to Christ, but he is your adversary. What does he do? First, it says he roars, A tactic of a lion is to roar to incite fear. He wants you to fear him. He wants you to lose your nerves, be reactionary, and especially he wants you to run. Right? And then that, like, just just, like, for those of you that ever, like, been scared by a dog or something, like, when you run, guess what happens? Like, those primal instincts, like, he's, like, chasing you, right? So, again, like, 
He wants to, the devil, lion, wants to roar, he roars, to incite fear so that you would run and you would be isolated because you're all not going to run the same direction, I promise you, right? And so he's going to find one of you that goes off and isolates you, right? That's the tactic of the devil roaring. What else does he do in this text? He roams. He's seeking about whomever he may devour. He's roaming. Seeking and searching throughout this world. You want to read a scary text? Go to Job chapter 1, verse 7. Job chapter 1, verse 7. Satan is asked in Job 1, where'd you come from? What have you been doing? And Satan says these words. He says, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking back and forth on it. That's a scary text. And it's repeated in chapter 2, verse 2. Okay, where'd you come from, Satan? Where have you been? I've been walking about. I've been going to and fro throughout the whole earth. Now, I want to remind you, Satan isn't God. He's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere all the time. But you know what he does? He roams everywhere. He is constantly looking. That's what Satan does. He, he roars and he roams. And it tells us here his ultimate aim is what? The text says he wants to devour. He wants to devour. Literally, it means to swallow. He wants to consume you. That is the desire of the chief adversary, who is your adversary, who is roaring, who is roaming about. He wants to devour you. Now, certainly pictured here is death, right? I mean, if a lion eats you, just let me let you in on this, you're dead, right? You're, you're going to die if a lion swallows you. So certainly death is pictured here, right? Uh, and, it, and it goes right along with other texts like John 8, 44. In John 8, 44, the scripture says, he's talking, uh, P Jesus is talking here, he says, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a what? He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. So clearly from this passage and others, Satan's desire is that you would die. He wants to kill you. Clearly. He is a murderer from the beginning. But I believe this text here in, in verse 8, to devour, swallow, is an interesting word that, that leaves open another possible picture here. Certainly death is pictured but, but this, this idea of devour, literally to swallow up, is used in other passages. One of the most familiar we read on Easter Sunday often in 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 54, it describes death as being swallowed up in victory. So this picture of because of the resurrection of Jesus, death is this great monster death in our life is consumed, it's swallowed up by a greater victor uh, in, in Jesus and his resurrection victory. So the cross has victory over death. The, the, the death of Jesus has victory over death itself. I'm convinced that, that Satan, if he cannot kill you, he would love and he's very content to have your life dominated, swallowed, if you will, by anything other than Jesus. Satan is super content if you will be consumed by anything other than Jesus Christ. The most common heart idols, if we kind of get on the big icebergs of what are the big idols that all of us deal with, are money, sex, and power. That's where the human heart, down through the ages, have put their idolatry. We, we try to find satisfaction in things other than Jesus. We've given our lives for possessions. We've given our lives for pleasure. And we've given our lives with pride and trying to get power. L let me just speak for just a quick moment to some of you young people out here. Right? The church is losing young people at a pretty alarming rate. Parents, uh, quick reminder, right? Our, especially our public school system, 
is not a neutral player with our children. Okay? Parents, the screen time that you give your children, let me just remind you, the media world out there is not neutral to the heart of your children. We're surprised sometimes when one day we wake up and our kids have completely abandoned the faith. They've completely made it known that they're walking away from it all. Listen, I'm thankful for things like Pastor Trevin on Friday took our teens out kayaking. Just like being out in creation. Like, awesome, right? God created that. And when you're out there, you're like, this is something, right? This is amazing. But, but parents, let me remind you, and, and teens, let me remind you, those, those things are not neutral in your life. We can't think of them as, as anything other than they are disciplers. They're trying to, I mean, billions and billions of dollars are spent. I, mean, I heard this set years ago. It's, it's, it's got to be crazy higher these days. The, the industry of, of, of the gaming industry, of Xbox and PlayStation, you take all the professional sports combined, professional baseball, professional basketball, professional football, professional hockey, you all, and all the millions that each of those players are making, you take that revenue together, and it's less than the gaming world that's trying to steal the hearts and minds. And if they're consumed with that, hey, they're not following Jesus. They're consumed. Billions of dollars are spent to capture the hearts of our young people. Young people, be aware. Be alert. Stay, stay awake. Satan wants to devour. That's what he does. You will be consumed by the adversary if you're not alert. If you're not ready, it will come. He is a great deceiver. Stay alert. Secondly, in this passage, verse number 9, it says, stand together. Resist him. Stand together. Resist, verse 9. It seems like a ludicrous statement, right? You've just told me, like, lion. And then, and then the next phrase is, don't run? Like, what? Like, don't run. Stand strong. Resist. It's crazy words. Everything in you is saying run. And the texture says resist. Stand fast. There's two clarifying phrases here. Resist. First, it's steadfast in the faith. It's just a key reminder that we're not standing in our own strength. In the context, again, Back to chapter 5, verse 6. We, we read this a moment ago. We're to submit under what? The mighty hand of God. I, I just, it's just a key reminder that, that God is the, the one that can, he really is the one that has the power here. If we want to walk in our own pride instead of in humility, submitting to God to resist the devil, we're going to fall flat. Promise you. I think of it this way. We, we've we're going to talk about the Novex uh, uh, next Sunday. We, we have missionaries at our house often. We're, we're usually the host of the missionaries. And, you, you know, my, many of you have met my dog Spurgeon, sometimes running around the church. Um, but Spurgeon is one that he often feels like he's above kids. <laughs> so, so I'll try to, that these kids, and then sometimes these missionary kids are like never been around a dog before. And they're scared. And I'm like, hey, you're in charge, you know. And I'm like, you, you tell him to sit, and he'll sit. And they're like, really? Like, I can command this dog over there? And so, so I'll be like, yeah, let's do this. And so I can bring him over, and I'll be like, tell him. And they'll, they'll be like, sit. And I'll be behind him like, you know? I'll be behind him like, you better sit down like this, you know? And they'll sit down and be like, good job, you're good, you know? And it's like, I think of that sometimes with us. Like, you're going to resist the devil. Like, and you can see Spurgeon with a smirk on his face like, oh, kids. You know, and he'll sit down as I'm back behind him going, you down. You know, and I feel like with the devil, like you and I literally, I mean, you think about Satan, this great adversary of Christ. You and I are not going to be like, hey, like I'm Ben Smith, and I'm telling you I'm standing against you. Like, it'd be like mock worthy, Right? 
But it's like you have the mighty hand of God standing behind you being like, sit down, right? This is your call in the cosmic battle of God to stand fast in the faith, right? Stand fast in the faith. You see, you see, God has made promises. God has told us, God has begun a good work in you, chapter 5, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. He has accomplished through the work of Jesus, he has begun to open blind eyes. Those who are in denial of who they are before God, he's opened your eyes of your sin. He's rescued you from yourself, and he's not going to fail you to hold on to you all the way to the end. That's what, what God's going to do. It's a, it's a, it's a, we're going we're to believe what God has said. And, and, and now he calls us to stand against the very devil himself? Yes. And, and he who began a good work in you, he's going to bring it to completion. That's what God does. So stand steadfast in the faith. Keep believing Christ. Keep believing. Don't be deceived. The deceiver will want to get you off the truth and start shuffling truth around. So stand, stand on the truth. Stand on the faith, what God has said. So first, in this clarifying statement here, we're to, we're to resist or stand together by the steadfastness of our faith. Secondly, this idea of together really is here, this you're not alone, secondly. Look at verse 9. He tells, says there, many are suffering the same kind of persecutions around the world. Many people are going through the same thing that you are going through. And, and I just want to remind you today that there's strength in numbers. All of us, even in our weakness of going through hard things, there's strength in that. Now, now a couple of things here. One, don't forget to look around in your sufferings. You know, there's a tendency for us to have the Elijah syndrome. Do you remember Elijah in the Old Testament? Jezebel has threatened Elijah's life. I mean, it's like, like just after Mount Carmel and this successful, amazing display of God. And then Jezebel threatens Elijah's life, and he's like, oh, woe is me. There's no one else standing for God, and I'm going to die. Just take my life, Lord. And you're like, what? And God's like, there's hundreds of guys I've kept as well. So just relax and look around right? Look around. Don't forget to look around in your suffering. You're not the only one. In suffering, we tend to get isolated, right? Don't forget in your suffering to look around. Secondly, don't forget to speak up. Let me just, let me just say this from a pastoral heart to you guys. In suffering, many of you think it's almost ungodly to share with others what you're going through and ask for prayer. Like sometimes it's twisting of the arm to say, can we put this in the prayer bulletin? And people are like, no, no. I, would, I don't want to share with others, right? Uh, uh, let, me, let me just say this. It's, don't forget to look around, but don't forget to speak up in your suffering. When you're going through hard things, Peter here says what? You resist, stand strong together, knowing that there's others going through the same thing. Your brotherhood Brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are going through this. Think of this. If, if, if we're sitting in the woods and there's a lion roaring and we feel very isolated and, and somebody cries out, I'm scared. And you're like, what was that? And you're like, hey, I'm scared too. And somebody over here is like, hey, I'm scared too. And then we're like, hey, we're, to- we're told to resist the devil. And so let's stand together. You know how tribes in Africa hunt lions? They don't, like, send out a champion. They come in with spears and sh- uh, shields all together. Right? This is how they, they, they stand together. Folks, we're called to stand together. Loneliness can roar all at once. Cancer can roar all at once. Frustration with your kids' decisions can roar all at once. Turmoil at work, ungodliness in our culture... Physical weariness and pain can roar all at once. And we're called to do what? We're called to stand together. Trust the Lord. Stand together in solidarity with other believers. And so take advantage of that. God calls you to stand, not by yourself, but together. With intimidation, the lion roars. 
He wants you to run into isolation, but we're called to stand together here. Third thing I want to I point out from verse 10, and I want you to miss this as a key point of this text, and that's to lean into divine support. Lean into divine support. Verse number 10. We have a great enemy. This text has made it clear. But we have a much greater God. Think of passages like 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I think of this passage where, where, where Peter says he prays for divine support. He, he kind of blesses them. But may the God of all grace, this prayer here, may the God of all grace who's called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a, a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. It's an amazing prayer that Peter ends his book with the God of all grace. I think he's talking here, this first part, this first phrase, he's talking into your individual needs in mind. Into your individual needs, insert divine grace. So here, this divine support, on an individual need level, there's this divine grace. He says here that he is the God of all grace. Peter's pointing you and I to our all-sufficient God. What do we tend to say in our suffering? Well, you're, well, well mine's different than yours. And, and, and we kind of, again, isolate ourselves. This is the God of all grace. He is all-sufficient, and his care is ready and available for all. All power and all favor that we will ever need is found in God himself. He is the God of all grace. Go back with me to chapter 4, verse 10. There's a similar idea here in the context. He says in chapter 4, verse 10, he describes here, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. In this passage, he's talking about living out our, our, our love for one another, living out hospitality with one another in the previous couple of verses here. And he says that here God uses each one of us to bless each other. So, so in the, the manifold grace of God that he never runs out of, it's all sufficient. Use it to bless as good stewards of it to minister to one another. So God's grace is available to all your needs, and he's, he's pouring it out on you, and you're to, to be used by God in, in the life of others. You see, Satan wants to distract you with all your circumstances, with all your needs, and Scripture lifts your eyes to your all-sufficient Savior, to the, all, the God of all grace. So lift your eyes to him. Individual needs meet divine grace. So secondly here, there's this collective hope collective hope that you look to divine strength. The scripture here has this beautiful summary statement of the gospel. He says here, he's called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. This great summary of the gospel, by grace alone, he calls us out of our sin, out of our spiritual blindness, where we deserve eternal separation from him, eternal death, but by the work of Christ, he dies in our place, and, and, and we are given what? We're, we're given eternal life, eternal glory. You see, just like we had said before, God didn't just start the work. God didn't just call you. He, he's going to bring it all the way to completion. The God who, who called you and saved you from chapter 1, he's going to lead you all the way to the end to eternal glory, this passage says. Those who will believe in him. So, so remember this. So believe this. God didn't just start a good work in you in salvation and then say, good luck. Right? He began. He's going to bring it to completion. This is your great hope and my great hope this morning. That by faith in the gospel, we're adopted into the family of God. And now there's this unending glory in front of us where there was before was only death. There's unending glory. It's this key truth. So when the power of the lion, the roaring lion, is, 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 is happening around us and it incites fear in us, his fear is what? That he's going to end our life. This, this death is going to be in front of us. That's what Satan uses as a fear on us. 
But what? For the Christian, because of the good news of the gospel, because of the good news of Jesus, we have eternal life. That's why we sing glory, glory, hallelujah, right? Because, because the, 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 the threat of death that is the lion's roar against us, because of the gospel, that bearer, that fear, we have eternal life. We have everlasting glory in front of us. The lion, the devil, holds the end, death, in front of you. But the lion of the tribe of Judah, our redeeming Savior, our suffering Savior, holds endless glory in front of you. So what? So live right now in light of glory. Live all the way with the end in mind, with the divine support that he's going to offer you all the way to that end that he has for you. Because he says, that's what I have. I've called you. I have eternal glory in front of you. But in the meantime, even though you go through suffering, here's the support. Here's the divine support. So lean into it. The, the, the divine support of strength. He says, I'm going to perfect. That means restore. Though you're tested with trials, he's going to set right those wrongs. All the damage that sin and suffering has brought into your life, God can repair. He's going to establish. It means to make firm. He's going to strengthen, to impart strength. As you stand against the roaring lion, he's going to settle. It's to secure your foundation. God is going to do all these things to bring support and strength into your life in the middle of this colossal battle with the evil one. Each one of us plays a part. And God has not abandoned you and he's not abandoned me in this battle. Even though Satan has been, he's been, the decisive blow against Satan has been served at the cross, he still roars. He still seeks to intimidate. He still seeks to isolate you. But you have divine support, all the divine support that you will ever need. And so lean into it. Lean into his grace. Lean into his strength for your daily struggle. And I, and I close with this. This thought in chapter 5, verse number 11, it ends with a doxology. And I just encourage you to, to live for God's glory. To live for God's glory. We, we just passed Mother's Day. You know, there's some crazy stories out there of moms who, when their children are in trouble, they like do crazy stuff, right? They're like, what, what, whatever it takes to protect. And, and they'll put themselves in harm's way. They'll do whatever it takes, right? There's some wild stories out there. This passage puts into perspective all that you and I go through. All those hard threats, hard, hardships, all those threats of the devil in the middle of this world system that opposes God. And it doesn't, notice it doesn't say, man, you're going to have the victory and your name's going to be great if you stand for God. It doesn't put your name in front of everything. It puts God's name up in front. It says, it, it, it puts to him be glory. To him be glory. It puts this perspective on God's glory. And it reminds you and I, your actions and your risk, your, your, your life is for his name. Like a mom to her little ones, you are to live for his name's sake, for his glory. And so risk, and so go, and so tell the story of the good news of the gospel. Risk for his name's sake. It's not about you. It's about God's glory. So make his name glorious everywhere. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This passage, this book, wh whether you are in front of your wife like Peter was, who's being crucified to amplify your pain, and, and you're, to, you're to tell her, what, what are you going to say in th that moment of suffering? Whether you're struggling with a simple, crazy journey of life, this book is for you. And this ending puts it all into this cosmic perspective, right? And it tells us <clears throat> that our God is bigger than our enemy and that we're to join him in the cosmic battle against our enemy. Your life matters. Make his name glorious. This world is being devoured by the evil one. 
Sometimes our young people are being devoured by the, 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 the evil one. Live for Christ. Make his name known. Stay alert. Stand together. Lean on divine support and live for God's glory. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this passage. Oh God, we, we really just end with this prayer that, that Peter gives here, Lord. We, we pray that, that your peace would be part of our life. We need you. God, we need the God of all grace. Lord, I pray that you'd give us a heart for you. This, this is something, when, when we think about our little lives and the, the big machine of life and the power of the evil one, we feel pretty helpless. And so, Lord, there's this little band of brothers and sisters in this room that, that we're called to do this together. And, and I ask God that you would, just because it says this is what we're supposed to do, doesn't mean always what we do. Lord, I, I pray that you would take this place. And, and Lord, it, it's, it's devoted to you in a, in a generic way, but it's our lives that, that really make the name of Jesus exalted in a, in a specific way. And so, God, I pray that our lives together would, would do just what this passage says, just what we've been preaching on for months now from 1 Peter, that, that it would be whatever happens in the hardships of life and the persecution that, that we can only see is mounting once again in culture against Christ and against Christ's people, that you would cause Christians not to lose heart, but Lord, stand together and stand for Christ and make his name known. God, thank you for... This passage reminds us about the greatness of our God. Lord, we would be helpless and hopeless apart from, from you. And so help us to embrace the hope that we have in Christ. Help us to share the love that we have in Christ. Help us to, to be, believe the truth, Lord. Help us to believe that faith may be built up in us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.